So, we recorded a video podcast with my friend Mayank who is a robotics engineer with experiences in India and Europe like me. He is currently working in India as a senior robotics engineer in a great startup called Viman. Apart from our background and all the interesting conversations we have in this video, this video covers three main questions. 1. What is it like working in robotics startups? 2. What are the challenges we face as robotics engineers in startups? 3. And the most important one, How should we go about learning in this amazing domain of robotics? We had a great time recording this video and I hope you have as much fun as we did. Thank you. So, this is Mayank. He is a robotics engineer like me. Uh, he has worked in Europe and India uh same as me and right now he's working in India. I'm working in Europe. I've seen his journey in the past as a robotics engineer which was kind of parallel to mine and I was kind of sure that this will be a very interesting conversation the motive of this conversation is uh, our experiences in robotics and mainly how we think about learning robotics and how moving ahead in this domain is quite exciting and challenging at the same time so mayank what is it that you do how are you liking it what is your journey let's start with what is yeah. what you do right now sure so i am a senior software engineer at viman Uh, which focuses on warehouse robotics and um, computer vision solutions, and they basically focus on um, in wall-to-wall solutions for inventory management, cycle counting, and kind of augmenting the humans to reduce human error at every um, aspect of um, the goods coming into the warehouse till they go out to fulfill orders. so what that ends up meaning is that i work on a lot of camera systems now those cameras could be mounted on uh, say a truss or an arch or a gate from where the forklift kind of enters the warehouse with the box and we kind of want 13 cameras to see if uh, the goods are damaged if it's the correct box coming in or not instead of finding out maybe two days later when it's time to ship out the box and you end up with a brick or a soap instead of your iphone so to reduce those reverse logistics we kind of work in that space to even things which are already kept on racks and you would imagine they are kept where they're supposed to uh and then somebody goes to find the thing and it's not even there anymore not because somebody stole it even though that might happen uh just because it's a massive scale at which logistics logistics operations happen nowadays uh like the kind of warehouses we cater to are at least 20000 square feet in size so there we have a uh, currently a drone solution which is autonomous and flies around the racks at night when nobody is around and can kind of check if the things are in the correct places where they're supposed to be and then another product i work on is um say similar to your supermarket automated checkout systems wherein uh, you might have a warehouse which is supplying an assembly line and there are certain goods which until now were scanned by hand with a barcode scanner and people had to do a lot of data entry to check out but now because we use computer vision to detect the label um, read the text on it as well as the barcode and to check against the warehouse management system you can it's as easy as just placing it on a scanner or on a conveyor and the rest of the work is handled by our system and you just kind of take it out of the warehouse so in terms of what i do when it comes to these products at viman i started my journey as a firmware engineer which um strictly speaking is not just firmware in the company I, because i think that's how roles are in startups you kind of have to dabble in a lot of different areas and i think sharad you know that more than anybody um so yeah we end up being the glue logic the firmware team uh, between the computer vision team who maybe spends more time focusing on the algorithms or the deep learning models uh the software or the back end team which handles the server side of things um as well as say the double e mechanical teams who would actually do the hardware um and kind of create the mechanical enclosures for it the wiring harnesses the boards that we use inside so we end up writing everything from the low level embedded firmware bare metal which runs on mcus to maybe something like the nvidia jetson series platforms and kind of writing the application layer in c++ or python to kind of tie together uh, the business logic of the state machines with these other components of the entire system so that that's where i started and uh, to finish my rant i am now in the world of navigation 
uh, after almost one and a half years, I felt like I really was more interested in learning more about SLAM and navigation algorithms and really wanted to get my hands dirty beyond the N number of Coursera and edX courses that I've done and always felt like it's a damn toy problem. So now I've entered the navigation team to kind of get my hands dirty with some real world navigation problems which we have um, in the drone and also other products which are now under development uh, called the pick track, which is basically cameras on a forklift for localization and other use cases. So yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Interesting. So when you mentioned Coursera courses, it like, immediately clicked because like, I think all of us have been through this journey and I think we'll circle back to this when we mm. talk about how, like how we ended up learning and mm. how we are still learning. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, but so Viman is uh, one of the startups, which I kind of like like uh, in India, are they catering to the US market or the Indian market? Of course, if you uh, I think ex- exclusively the American market as of now, I okay. think a lot of our, our, our customers are finally online. They came out of stealth this March at a big party at this uh, fest called uh, Expo called Modex. And um, yeah, you can check our stuff which is public on Viman.ai. But um, yeah, the structure is such that we have like shared engineering between the Bangalore office and in the US and most of the operations, some of the leadership are based out of the US. So customers, ops, applications team is based in the US and uh, a lot of the R&D and the engineering is supported from India. So we, and and that ends up happening because we do a lot of the things in-house from hardware design to electrical, to mechanical design, to firmware, like I mentioned, platforms work, uh, computer vision, software. So we have competence in all of those areas and um, navigation or robotics algorithms, like I said, and because we kind of try to own every aspect of the product as much as possible within reason. And um, yeah, um, since warehousing is so big, uh, and there's so much scope for um, kind of augmentation of human effort with um, these computer vision based intelligent solutions. Uh, we're kind of targeting the, the West and the US right now. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Yeah, I think I've, I've seen this trend in India that many, many robotic startups, uh, I think almost all, I, I would take the liberty to say that almost all robotic startups in India cater to the West. And like mm-hmm. there, there are many reasons for that. One of the most important questions I wanted to ask is, how has your journey been like mm-hmm. getting into robotic? Because as you mm-hmm. said, any robotics engineer working in a startup has an interesting journey. It is never yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. Like how did you start? I, I, and how did you? Sure, learn? sure. My journey with robotics started in maybe. Uh, seventh or eighth grade when I was in school. And the reason for that was I was privileged enough to have uh, some very cool uh, folks who were professors at IIT Delhi and other places come in and uh, start like a Lego robotics club at my school. And that was my first brush with robotics or building anything. Like I never really built serious Lego stuff before that as well. So just getting to learn the mechanics aspect at that point was a lot of fun. And um, the entire point was you have these uh, easy Lego bricks kind of structures to build uh, gearboxes or like um, maybe not flying robots at that point, wheeled robots for the most part. Uh, but like just learn a lot of these basic sensing modalities, like you would have a simple light sensor, which would be able to detect reflectance and like those infrared ones, but in case in a Lego brick that you could easily attach, or there'd be a bump sensor, which would just bump into something and be like a uh, sort of like a contact switch, um, a sound sensor and motors and things like that. And you slap them together to get some form of intelligence with a lab view based uh, drag and drop GUI. So you don't really need to um, start with the basic programming constructs of written syntax, but the constructs of control flow, uh, conditionals, branches, and all that, we learned that very intuitively using drag and drop traffic lights and blocks which could kind of uh, encode logic. I I don't think Scratch was really popular at that time, but this LabVIEW based Mindstorms language was like really cool. Uh, but I do remember not being so attracted to that aspect at that point and being more attracted to the building and the physical tangible like stuff I could do with my hands kind of aspect. So like I remember that um, there was this one competition wherein we had to participate in something called the Indian Robot Olympiad, maybe in 2007 or eight around that time. 
and um, the problem statement was a simple a uh, green box where your robot starts it has to go to like a a line where a footballer would take a free kick and then chuck ping pong balls into like a soccer goal right and um, so here's where i understood about competition rules and how things work so we had a limit of say 250 by 250 by 250 mm for the bot that we could build and i was looking at interesting ways of quick ways of kind of you know um launching the ball into the spot and i look and i saw this design in the user guide or something for building a catapult and that was really fascinating because it was like a rubber band motor and it would slip at one point and like just kind of chuck the ball and i was like oh man i'll build two of them one on each side uh, make sure the bot is well within the design constraints and all of that and then just go there chuck two balls come back and i'll reload two balls and do that what i didn't account for was of course uh the probabilistic nature of failure of uh, sensing modality and measurement models because you didn't know any of that stuff right and also like i mentioned the rules part of it because my approach or our team's approach was this and then i see somebody at the challenge who had way more lego parts and money than me <laughs> build a total box which just filled up with like maybe some 15 20 tt was at once and essentially his algorithm was take a bucket chuck it and maybe 80 to 90% of those would land up in the goal <laughs> so the scoring was simply based on how many balls end up in the goal his approach won and he literally built like a cube which exactly fit within 250 by 250 by 250 and that was the first i was like oh man it's smart hacks like this which actually work in the real world where you have to play with all the uncertainties and things of that sort i remember going to another competition where i built the canonical line following robot and i didn't account for the fact and and yeah we we did all the logic with okay how do you handle intersections and t joints and left and right turns and all of that um in say a, a slightly complicated line following use case but i didn't account for the fact that there could be a tunnel and <laughs> it's corner cases like that which get you right so my 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 bot had to go up a hill it went up and then there was a tunnel on the hill and it just freaked out inside it kept like spinning in circles on the hill and never came out of that tunnel and that was like a teachable moment because we were the only probably school kids at that competition it was a college level one at iit bombay and but man it was a lot of fun and i was hooked at that point um but when i came to 12th grade um i think it's sort of a fault in the way um maybe particularly in the indian education system you have to focus so much on getting really strong in physics and math and chemistry to crack engineering entrance exams uh when i did take on computer science as an additional subject it felt very dry to me and something which needed way more effort than i was ready to give while handling all the core subjects uh i mean there's only so many writer program which does factorials and number pyramids and star pyramids that you can tolerate and uh, when i saw that most people would uh, maybe uh, just kind of learn by heart the tricks as they do now for dsa programming interviews for big companies um, to crack the question that that <laughs> doesn't work for robotics companies even though exactly my point right yeah because it's so multidisciplinary yeah. so uh, that kind of pushed me away from coding at that point and almost to a phobia level because when i did come back and uh, uh new slash i joined engineering the same college as sharad uh, it was a really cool fun place where um, since uh, unlike a lot of universities in india uh, classes weren't mandatory you did have the option of staying back in your hostel rooms and like chilling the entire day if that means you can still clear exams while doing that but what i noticed was that a lot of people were either opening companies or doing something they were really passionate about or working on hobby projects almost like every third person in my hostel corridor was like that also because so, we had no attendance policy at all so. exactly like i said since that's so much you can there's only so many movies and tv shows you can watch in a day you once get that bug while being exposed to seniors and that nice healthy engineering culture so um yeah i think i i started doing some electronics hardware hobby projects at that point or maybe even while i was getting into um, which which is our college i remember not even filling computer science on the preference list i did not want computer science uh, I, I, i i really it came down to whether i want to get into mechanical engineering or electrical and electronics 
and since my dad had done mechanical engineering at this point i asked him what is the course work like uh, like and he told me that it's mostly thermodynamics such sort of uh, strength of materials and how you go into say um, maybe more newtonian physics and advanced levels of that and uh, fluid dynamics things like that so I, i could kind of get a sense of okay that's more or less what we learned in physics in 11th grade and in 12th is when we had electromagnetic theory and we had things like transistors and logic gates and all of that and that appealed to me more um and like yeah ohm's law kirchhoff laws and things like that so i was like okay yeah then maybe i'll go for electronics and not this me- mechanical engineering like i put that higher in my preference list so and i remember i had this thick book on lego mindstorms robotics and one more thing i did was um i went back to that book to check the authors and see what they did in their lives to become robotics engineers today <laughs> and i saw that everybody had a different path because exactly. we were at an age where probably uh, robotics was now becoming a household name at, e- at least in india i don't think there are still any bachelor's programs in robotics which exist it's mostly considered as either a post graduate degree or like a diploma afterwards as a skill training exercise or sometimes like even a phd because a masters is exactly. not enough if you talk yeah, about yeah. degrees i mean on honestly i i kind of have a problem with degrees but yeah, uh, yeah. but that's that's a personal thing i mean some yeah. people may disagree no but but i'm just saying that even if you want to be exposed to something in a structured curriculum fashion you don't know where you'll get that mix mm-hmm. i knew there were masters courses and i i i had kind of heard about carnegie mellon i knew that okay that course exists i knew that maybe some others have it um but yeah uh, i mean for me it was like uh i had done robotics in school and when i reached college or undergrad i really felt like i want to take my own time with it because i had had this almost burnout level prep while getting into engineering i really wanted to do something creative instead so much so that i did not even get into the electronics robotics club at college i did only hobby projects at the pace which i felt comfortable and all i did was play drums for 4 years but once you graduated uh hmm. did you start working in robotics already or did you find a way to was robotics or life found a way for you to work in no, no 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 i'll tell you what so for me the thing has been like i that that interest was always alive mm-hmm. i knew i wanted to end up in robotics and as i learned more about the domain i could see various paths converging towards it or kind of understanding what it means i i, I feel like i have been through several stages of disillusionment at different stages in my life like i mentioned right uh, the first was probably understanding that um, maybe my own interest lies more towards electronics or double e than um, towards mechanical because from a very naive school kid I, my understanding of mechanical engineering would have been hey i'll be the guy who builds the car and there'll be somebody who does the wiring and there'll be one guy who writes the code which is more or less correct but honestly when i get, got to the level of understanding what goes into building the car that wasn't stuff which appealed to me at, at least you know even at the outset so uh, th- that 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 was like my first level of understanding the next thing that happened was um there were a bunch of seniors at um bits who were taking coursework on robotics or i think embedded programming and um, we had this thing called center for technical education at which where in after school there would be some seniors who for kids who were interested would just out of their own free will and um, like yeah their own generosity would teach you the real embedded programming whether it was using avr and embedded c how to set up an id and kind of get into it deeper instead of just using like an arduino as most people would do in their hobby projects and i found that quite fascinating and i had a lot of fun and i was sort of good at it so i enjoyed that part a lot i started doing hobby projects on my own i, I remember right from second year in uh, undergrad i tried to look for uh, internships even if they were unpaid at startups even if it was for just 3 weeks or 4 weeks so like every holiday i had i would try to like just look for a company where i could freelance and the first thing i ever did was for a robotics company which was selling these robotics kits which were essentially like motor drivers wheels etc you know the drill like an avr board and right. a, a bunch of company, sensors right. to like, kids i know what you're talking about yeah there are multiple companies which do that model and kind of sell those robotics workshops to kids from school or universities and i i think my first thing was to make it more approachable and less intimidating make a gui in qt 
which can just flash seven different examples onto an AVR based platform uh, while writing the example code to interface all the different sensors as well. So I, I, he just gave me like a bucket load of sensors, like an ultrasonic sensor, a sound sensor, a color sensor, touch, like infrared flex, uh, I think flex sensor, all sorts of things, a simple pod. And I, I just had to kind of come up with interesting, uh, maybe even gimmicky use cases to attract kids um, and to make it really easy for them to just kind of flash the board. So to come up with the GUI for that as well. And that was something I did in a month and I really enjoyed that. And so by, by my, I think by my second or third year, I slowly started seeing the appeal of writing code, which has direct manifestation in the real world. And that's what got me hooked. And All this while, when I used to think of it as abstract, math or it always used to seem like an unassailable mountain and i always used to feel dumber than the other person and so many years later i've understood that yes of course there are a lot of smart people who are really good at computer science but when it comes to engineering and building products more often than not it's about how much time you spend with the problem and this the time this process of you also working on the software side of things was probably not repulsive because you were building something, right? Like it was coming yeah, yeah, of towards it's instant, it's, and instant gratification, man. Exactly. I mean, it wasn't an assignment I was being graded for. I, I built a lot of stuff for fun in hardware before this, uh, which kind of brought me to the world of learning concepts that I would learn maybe a grade later at university even. Like I got into audio amplifier circuits to build like a headphone amplifier because while drumming my a phone couldn't pump out enough signal. So that's how I got into like pocket amplifier circuits. And um, the first thing, the first complex circuit that I soldered on my own on a zero PCB was a, a remote and an intervalometer for my camera. So I had a small mirrorless camera and the, buying the remote seemed too expensive. So I thought, why don't I make one instead? And I looked at the Arduino library for uh, infrared control and sending LIRC, uh, sorry, IR commands to control this and later with the Raspberry Pi as well, just to trigger the shutter. So if I want to do long exposure or like a time lapse somewhere, I could just kind of hook up my remote power it by a battery, set a timer with a knob and press a button and keep firing every X seconds or something and I'd get a time lapse at the end of it. So it was stuff like this, which I wanted to use, but felt like I would rather build it so that I could learn something along the way, which got me motivated towards learning those aspects of the things that I did. And these, uh, I think I did a one workshop at a uh, university, which was a lot of fun, like a robotics workshop where I got introduced to the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. And that for me was my foray into embedded Linux. Um, this was right when the Raspberry Pi, the model B had just come out. There were no guides on the internet on how to use it without a screen and a keyboard. And I spent a week learning how to get it to run headless in terms of understanding just the basics of networking, plugging in a router, um, checking out the, uh, get, getting into the login page on the router, the admin console, seeing uh, what does static IP even mean? What is a DHCP, DNS, just all those terms and getting into that. And the dope and that hit you get fun. once all this effort. Yeah, yeah. and yes. understanding that it's going to be 90% frustration and 10% dopamine. Yeah, that's, <laughs> like, that, 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 that's true. But in your case, I think after that, you worked in Bangalore for a bit and no, then I, didn't. I actually went for a master's right after and okay, right. on on this side while doing my hobby projects i got the opportunity of actually getting into wireless sensor networks so it was an area i was a bit interested in and I, even though it was something which wasn't taught to undergrad programs um, through projects under our professor and guide at that time me and a, a close friend of mine, Laksh, we started doing stuff in our free time with that professor, like basic research and uh, projects to kind of work on uh, sensor networks, understanding MacLear protocols, an RTOS called TinyOS, and working with these sensor modes, which can run for like three years on two AA batteries and things like that. And that was another really fascinating world for me because um, this was, I think, my foray into networked embedded systems. And it's only later that now hindsight is 2020 and I see how all these parts fit together to build like say a distributed fleet architecture or when you want to have like a command and control station which has very efficient com uh, command and control links with you know uh, really small packet sizes and you don't want to use HTTP for that. You need to know what happens in resource constraint devices and how people do ad hoc networks that 
I can see where this element fits in the context of robotics. But at that time, I was just having fun learning about sensor networks. And uh, I, at that point, uh, I think when I was applying for grad school, I got into uh, Carnegie Mellon for the MRSD Mobile Robotic System Development Program. But honestly, um, I had learned German in school and I really wanted to visit Europe and spent two years there. Um, I felt like embedded was a fun field. I wanted to explore it a bit more. Didn't want to really jump domains yet. And I felt like there was enough of a connect between firmware or embedded systems and robotics that I could find my way into robotics, even if the path meant like meandering around a bit more. So I really wanted to see what the domain of embedded systems or firmware had to offer before I really understood okay, what does robotics in 2022 or a robotics engineer's job in 2022 really require more than look like? Because of course, to build a robot, you still need all those parts. You need a guy who knows firmware, you need somebody who builds a damn structure, 3D prints out the CAD model that you just think of in like a pencil sketch. And you need somebody who can uh, do the algorithms part on top. And because of, I think my baggage as well with pure software for its own sake, I kind of went to that piece last. So I got enough exposure everywhere. Um, and though I felt like, yes, I do want to enter robotics right now. Um, I the, the first job that I took up at the company, which you mentioned was a thermal camera company. Mm -hmm. So totally like a different tangent from all of the stuff that I was yeah, like, playing. No robotics whatsoever. Like from yeah. what I understand, because I had a similar role there, uh, a lot of firmware engineering, like we were yes. based from the engineers there but like no robotics person yeah and but i did get to play around with the jetson series a lot so i got to play with the jetson tx2 and build a product which was like a fusion camera fusing uh day optics uh, like a rgb camera feed uh, uh thermal camera night optical feed as well as like v2x communication with vehicle infrastructure and cars and all of that and that was a lot of fun because I learned CPU programming before because of that. So CUDA. I learned CUDA. Yeah, I learned CUDA. And then for another product, which was built on a Snapdragon platform, like a handheld mm -hmm. uh, thermal camera, uh, I learned OpenCL as well. So thermal imaging, like Sharad knows, is a very um, tricky problem in terms of getting a very nice and clean final output. The raw sensor data just looks like garbage and you have to do a bunch of different image processing before you can get something which resembles like a human figure or something. But once it does work, it's magical in the kind of things that we have seen in long wavelength IR imaging. Like if you if you kind of so much as press your fingers on your face and leave it, you can actually see millikelvin level differences on your yeah. face. So it's pretty cool when it works. But um, yeah, so that really... So I learned engineering at school and grad school, but it's at my first job that I feel like I really became an engineer. That, so, so, so <laughs> that is what I totally agree with. I mean, yeah. like learning robotics is a different ball game, which comes with experience. So, I mean, yeah. it sometimes can become a cash 22 situation where yeah. you need experience to learn. I'm not even talking about getting a job. Like that's, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Legit. but you, you need to be at the right place at the right time or at least with the right people to be able to like yeah. learn. So just to drive the message home about you saying uh, people who work in robotics and in startups have a meandering journey and like a twisted mm -hmm. journey sometimes with a lot of experiments in some way. Mm -hmm. I had a very similar journey. Uh, so when I started my college, I, I was not into robotics at all. Mm -hmm. But in the first day of my college, I joined a robotics club. So we are from the same college. Mm -hmm. You did not yeah. join in the club i joined the club that was my first uh, like exposure to robotics mm -hmm. and i was still not like super serious about it i was like yeah let's let's see what happens i'm just curious mm -hmm. um and then we ended up participating in robogon which was a like, mm -hmm. state and national level robotics uh, competition in india that was held in pune and uh, that was the turning point where we were working on like system engineering although that was quite yes. naive for that time but it's it's not mm. about complexity it's about you mm. liking system engineering in my case because i feel that robotics especially in startups is mm. a lot of system engineering yeah for sure right so that is when i realized that hey this is nice and then i started working as a hardware engineer like pure hardware engineer in our uh, robotic startups in startup in india called gray mm. orange 
बट आई लकीली हैड अ प्योर सॉफ्टवेयर डेव एक्सपीरियंस वेरी इंटेंस सॉफ्टवेयर डेव एक्सपीरियंस इन माई इंटर्नशिप दैट वॉज एन एन वीडियो I mm, nice. hated software engineering before that. I mean, I'd be like, "You take all my money, I will not go." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but as or don't even give you all the money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. as a uh, fate would have it, I kind of had no option. I was like, "I'm mm. doing an internship here. They gave me a software team. I asked for a hardware team. I can't do shit, so I might as well just learn." And my mentor yeah. was brilliant and extremely strict. So that's where I learned software engineering, and then I started working on hardware engineering because that is what I loved back then. And mm-hmm. eventually, it just like both of them came together. I never tried for it; it just happened. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, there was also a time after that where I was working not in robotics, not in like embedded embedded. I was working in a corporate. Uh, it was like quite nice. I was working as an ASIC uh, software dev, so mostly C plus plus system C. Uh, that was not robotics at all, but it. Gave me enough time to explore, do course or courses and stuff as well to understand that hey, I want to do robotics, mm-hmm. and that is what I want to do as an engineer. Everything else is nice, and mm-hmm. things started coming together. I had worked as a hardware engineer for a bit, a software engineer in my internship, a uh, firmware engineer where my uncle also worked for mm-hmm. a while. Uh, so they just came together. I never tried for it. Um, and then i decided to do a masters because i was like yeah now i'm sure and that was 3 and a half years after i graduated so for me yeah. i i explored different sub domains in right. engineering to understand what i like and then i mm-hmm. knew that i like robotics for a very specific reason because it is like it is it's all about system engineering and because mm-hmm. of my background and my likings i like to imagine systems like things coming together and how the what the mm-hmm. interplay is between them and how these things work together and one thing about uh robotics which i absolutely absolutely love is that you are always doing r and d uh mm-hmm. in a product based company the d component is super heavy so it's not mm-hmm. that we can spend time in research but you still have to do research to be able to do development and what i felt uh, over time is that each problem statement although all problem statements are tied together uh, it, it's mm-hmm. a chain towards something you're building but it's not that things are repetitive like you just mm-hmm. have to figure out a way to solve a problem and many problems have no explicit solutions out there because the mm-hmm. problem is so unique that you have to think about the solution you have to research you have to be creative so i actually say that robotics engineering is a very creative job I think that ends up happening because there are so many fields which kind of contribute towards making a damn robot. Exactly. Right? Uh, things don't work. You have Most to get them the to work. Yeah, like everything fails, and it fails often. It fails in ways and means you would never expect it to. Uh, you think your code is perfect, you deploy it in the field, and then the system gets hot. And to understand that you're seeing bugs and software print statements jumping at you because somebody forgot to add a cooling system uh, that's when you start realizing generally in the dom- domain of embedded systems and products and especially more so in robotics where you have so many sensors with noise and motors which don't obey your commands exactly and all of that nothing works without probabilistic control or um, all the other aspects or domains that you need to get things to work in the real world because there's an element of actuation as well um yeah because there's no option right like you and i both are the kind of people who need to see the damn thing work we cannot be people who've just worked on one element of it and if it doesn't we kind of abrogate ourselves of the responsibility that okay fine my firmware is fine and it can't i mean coming from a firmware ish background we both know how we straddle software and the higher layers of the application stack or the os and the hardware in in the middle right because uh, we need to be the ones who can say deterministically if it is the code or something wrong in the schematic or the layout which is the reason why this damn peripheral won't work the way you want it to so i i think having done enough firmware and embedded really made me a way more patient person so that made prepared me for working with things which fail miserably in the real world 
and i would even go as far as to say that that's probably something that people who go top down instead of bottom up don't get the advantage of like a lot i know a lot of people who come from a computer science background who come from a world of full stack development of back end and uh, kind of object oriented programming and um, being very conversant with design patterns and the like and the best practices of software engineering to first of all come to uh, a device with finite resources because it needs to run off of a battery in the most cases and suddenly you don't have all the compute in the world in the cloud if you do yes, the latency exactly. is that, not that changes everything right yeah yeah so so you, you try driving your robot off of a web server and then suddenly see when it falls off the edge of the table because your command was x milliseconds too late and that's grounding enough for you to understand the different constraints that come into the domain of robotics compared to conventional software development with neat things neatly running in containers and somebody else's computer on the cloud and mm. things of that sort so i feel like coming from bottom up when things fail we have the advantage of having at least hardware literacy if not a deeper understanding of how to design boards at scale for like very complex designs we know how to read a damn data sheet exactly and when things go wrong yeah that, and, that also helps that helps a lot for software development because because i've seen yeah. that uh now a major chunk of my time is software dev but yeah. it's but it's it's not traditional software dev no it's robotic yeah. software dev which yeah. includes embedded which includes reading the damn data sheet and sometimes yeah. a technical manual would be 150 pages 200 pages thousands man right? you open any processor <laughs> you go yeah. in the thousands you need a mouse with infinity scroll for that shit <laughs> right but finding relevant information from there and making yes. sense of it is a beautiful art which comes with yeah. time and that's why going from bottom mm. to top makes a lot of sense because you get those skills without even thinking about yeah. it you're you're just exploring learning and going up yeah but so I, you you basically highlighted all the challenges with robotics on a personal level i want to talk about why we still love this domain like what is your reason you like this domain a lot it's fun to see stuff move man like it's that weird god complex if you want to call it that it created something which drives from here to there on its own man that's crazy or it's just because it's the interplay of these domains and with the kind of people and the way we are wired we probably are more uh, i think eric schmidt has a thing about t-shaped people wherein mm-hmm. you should first be deep in one domain and then go broad so i feel like we strive to do that but i think of myself more of as a comb so wherein i go at different levels of depths in different domains that come together i might have like a central sphere i don't even know what that shape looks like but it, i think it looks more of a comb than a t so um yeah i mean it's because we love how the sum is greater than the parts mm-hmm. and how there's almost an emergent behavior aspect to the entire thing um that makes it so much fun of course it's the use cases that robotics enables which are unique um like the way drones are blowing up right now in terms of applications and use cases all over the world is crazy and it's a testament to how powerful this domain can be uh we have mobile robotics which are influencing different domains from the warehouse industry to self driving cars being attempted don't put a card box or your real kid in front of the cameras uh if you know what's happening at fsd but yeah i mean still uh, with all the challenges that come with the domain those are some really exciting possibilities which are only happening because of all these domains coming together yeah. and i think that's where the thrill for us lies that like you said the systems aspect of it right that exactly. you're not purely working on just maybe coming up with the most cool material for use in a various uh, like a large variety of use cases you're building something purpose driven which more often than not has to interact with an environment which is semi structured or maybe sometimes very unpredictable and you need to kind of get a team of really smart people who each play their own part it's considering robotics has so many domains at play you can no one person can do it alone as well right yeah. there might be other products where the board is simple enough for you to design but you kind of build a very complex application stack on top of it um maybe a lot of internet of things use cases have ended up in that domain wherein a lot of the parts are solved problems and you kind of differentiate your product based off of things like that robotics i feel is still in that uh trough of dissolution uh, like 
tough of disillusionment or like that slope of productivity that just comes right after mm-hmm. wherein people are now starting to get familiar with the fact that they have a cleaning robot at home i mean for a lot of people that's their first brush with robotics or you go mm-hmm. to the airport and there's like a robotic assistant which is a tablet over there or a telepresence robot and like there it's only now in our lifetimes in a in this stage of our lives that we're really seeing the democratization of robotics and that's exciting Right. because this thing that used to be fun that used to be toy problems and line following robots that we guys used to build is now finally entering uh, households and like the conversations even in india between us and our parents and the kind of realm of possibilities that that opens up so i feel that's a very exciting time to be in for the industry of robotics in general right and also one thing is that because of this interplay of multiple domains when we are working as robotics engineers when a problem statement comes in it's not that the problem statement is relevant only for one of the subdomains uh, mm-hmm. more often than not it is a problem statement you need to deal with using one of the subdomains or two or three or all of it so at yeah. least i am wired in a way that i don't care what that subdomain is i want to solve that problem if it's a mm-hmm. software dev problem it is a software dev problem if it's mm-hmm. uh, like mechanical it has to be solved mechanically and so ba- basically i think robotics engineering is more about saying hey this is a problem statement i'll do whatever it takes to solve it rather than hey this is a problem statement my job is to do only this part of it that does just doesn't work in startup robotics i i i think what attracts both of us in the creative sense is that creativity quite often comes out of constraints if you really want to hone your craft for example uh, i am really interested in photography and i go around photo works and stuff like that and if you have endless possibilities then quite often you become mediocre and you don't get anything good done or you don't really push yourself in where you are in your craft the moment you constrain yourself you get a lens which is 35 mm prime and uh, you have no zoom on the damn thing and you have to physically move forward and back to kind of get the frame that you have in mind or you shoot analog if you really are that sadist or masochist and um, <laughs> when you constrain yourself you become more creative and you hone your craft and your eyes and your senses more so similarly all of the problems that you spoke of right even if the problem presents itself as say a software problem and the answer to that is beyond the best algorithm also a better sensor you will always have a finite amount of power budget that you can put on the machine or a finite amount of money you can throw at the problem or a finite amount of engineering hours you can throw at the problem before you have to ship it so there will always be those constraints at play which will kind of force you to up your game in terms of understanding hey this is the best i can do in terms of optimizing these constraints for this timeline and what is like the long term version of that and how do i kind of look at a better plan if i had more time more money or all of that so you're always thinking on both tracks mm-hmm. and that ends up being a lot of fun right and also you have to consider that your short term solution should not be made in such a way that you have to start from scratch for your long term solution like your short yeah, yeah. has to lead to your long term solution right yeah. otherwise your short term solution will just be a bunch of patchwork which will yeah. be useless once you start to think about scalability i mean there's two things to that one is patchwork which is written so badly that it'll definitely fail in the field the moment somebody blows at it the wrong way and the other is that you architect a system based on your current understanding of the problem and as your understanding gets better you're not married to the solution mm-hmm. you really focus on the problem and you're married to the problem and as you because quite often like any other product it's a iterative process right there is um, more often than not that we never really falls into place in the world of robotics or product engineering you don't get perfect system requirements you don't get perfect customer requirements or technical requirements so you always are working with information scarcity and you build whatever you feel is the best way forward and quite often there's feedback which comes from the field from your internal customers or external which help you to iterate and when that iteration happens uh you just have to make sure that you are kind of using this new information to come up with maybe a, a better architecture than where you left it or what you came up with last time so as long as there's a push 
to come up with a better solution i think is totally fine if you end up having to go back to the drawing board because quite often the, you you otherwise kind of get stuck on a dead end and you have to reverse your car a bit before you can take that turn and go forward on the highway right mm -hmm. so I, i feel like these are a lot of abstract terms but this is i think what we've both experienced in the yeah, domain no, and of course i mean progress has to be incremental because we are also mm -hmm. supposed to deliver right like we, we yeah. can't develop forever for forever yeah. and and then hit a dead end like we need to be incremental yeah, yeah. and yeah. but also we have to be thoughtful about being incremental because like we know the long term vision is that the system yeah. has to be like scalable should do this yeah. should do that and of course it's not that you have all the pieces of the puzzle your yeah. requirements will change right yeah so you have to like it's 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 just a very tricky and beautiful thing i mean you can't really mm -hmm. describe that process it just happens like you have to just become better at it uh but like you've been talking about constraints which actually is quite a nice thing to talk about because that brings me to the next thing uh how has it been working in startups for you because one of the things which you will definitely highlight which i do too is you have limited resources and where resources mm -hmm. like time resource money resource mm -hmm. a uh, skill resource right mm -hmm. you you have everything because you do not have a team of 100 so you have limited skill yeah. the end, right you you do not have someone i mean you might but there is that there can be a chance where you, you do not have a computer vision veteran right mm -hmm. uh, like 20 years of computer vision uh, mm -hmm. so you have to make do with what you have resource wise mm -hmm. uh this requires a lot of creativity but in general how has your experience been working in startups because a lot of people have this question uh, should you work in startup should you work in big corporations so this becomes a very legit question i think it boils down to personal preference and what you value and prioritize um i come from a decent level of privilege where i felt like i could take a lot of financial risk i did not have that many fiscal responsibilities and so i was always in this comfortable zone where i was doing the best i could for my professional growth or my journey um without uh constraints at least in the financial aspect so i feel that does end up influencing a lot of people's decision as well when it comes to startups or say a risky endeavor versus like a uh, much more established or a bigger company so if that factor is out of the picture um i think my gut feeling where i have been right for a lot of cases is that if it's a slightly established startup wherein they have a bunch of the use cases figured out there is a revenue model they have some semblance of product market fit um you would more often than not be in a space where your growth can be exponential given 2 years or 3 years at a startup with sound engineering um the rest of the constraints kind of force you to learn how to swim right in the deep end and that can be very harrowing for some mainly to burn out for some but can also be very rewarding if you kind of manage it to whatever best way possible so there are moments where you take a step back and kind of see if um do you want a bit more work life balance and whether you can negotiate that in that context that team and things of that sort but purely from a learning or a trying your hands on stuff because and startups play much more aggressively as well right because they have so much more to lose um that um when going up against much bigger companies they have to show disruption or innovation or like major differentiation against the rest of the market so that ends up being a very exciting space engineering wise to be in because like you said there are development heavy processes and your product dev cycle is very d heavy but to get that differentiation you need to be grounded in research or at least be aware of the state of the art the functional state of the art let's put it that way like what is the state of the art not in terms of the coolest new research paper that came out with its open source implementation but that can also run on the damn platform that i'm trying to sell my product exactly so working with resource constraints as well right exactly so i mean um 
quite often people feel like uh, innovation disruption uh, research you kind of come up with the most leading edge technology and just take that algorithm and adapt it and it will be fine not necessarily space tech is often based off of things which are 10 years old because they need those non functional aspects of compute like reliability timeliness determinism that are very underrated in classical software engineering it's only when you come to embedded systems or robotics that you understand the value of those things uh, i mean your airbag not deploying in a car matters way more than the coolest new 7 inch screen which can play mario on in your right. car right so i mean uh, it, it really does come down to um understanding how much those aspects of sound engineering also matter and if you're in the right environment where you get to play with so many different toys uh both in terms of different hardwares or sensors and things that you're working with but also different domains and different people from those backgrounds i mean from what i've heard from my colleagues and friends and people like you and others who have experienced working at a bigger company honestly i never have myself yet um there is always that sense of being siloed in a department in a role in a bigger company right and that can quite often mean very bad echo chambers as well wherein first of all you don't even know maybe the best practices or uh, get to know about really cool things happening in associated domains of work which are related to yours you might be just focusing on one problem and improving that and the other thing is that sometimes the turnaround time for that is also so long right. that you might be gone from the company by the time the work you did ends up in the product that ends up in the hand of a customer which which happens very often i mean yeah the, exactly the development cycle is long of course because they are working on something which is extremely complex not that i mean what mm-hmm. we work on is also extremely complex but yeah i mean that turnaround time is too high for yeah. valid reasons of course yeah and i mean instant gratification means hobby projects which can be done in a weekend or a week but with startups which are established on the kind of places we guys work at i feel like it lands somewhere in the middle of right. a hobby project and something which is like a very serious engineering endeavor which has a lot of resources and millions dumped into it which is a long haul kind of effort right. so by being in a startup you kind of get to play that mid range of time which i feel is also very gratifying because you get to work with people in front of you like your team might just have maybe one more firmware engineer but you'll have to have a hardware guy a mechanical guy and you talk every day and um like i was mentioning about the systems thing and things failing root causing an issue when it comes to a product in robotics can be so convoluted mm-hmm. and so interesting like i've had cases wherein um a spacer between a board to board connector uh caused signal intermittence which led to a wifi driver kernel panic and this entire linux crashing and the only log people could see is a wifi kernel panic and kept force, uh, forcing the problem onto firmware and it was my job to kind of root cause and show how by shaving off 0.1 mm off of that spacer and a proper meshing of the connector uh the software or firmware bug goes away <laughs> so yeah this 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 happens quite often in like yeah. different problem statements so for me because i've worked in a big corporation and in startups mm-hmm. and then i chose to dedicate my like career towards startups yeah. and like not corporations was because one uh i'm not saying this in a negative way because it's mainly because of my personality uh yeah. you you do end up being siloed uh yeah. in most cases i would say i of course we can't generalize and say 100% of yeah. these cases uh, have this problem but uh, most honestly do uh, it, it's it's great for some people right some people like yeah. that way but if if you're the person who likes system engineering like combining multiple domains together mm-hmm. uh i don't really think of like mnc's are the way to go because you will dedicatedly work on a very small piece and that will mm-hmm. be a long haul uh and you might get expertise in that specific subdomain but it just doesn't translate to you working as a system engineer uh, later on mm-hmm. and there's one misconception where people think that if you're working on system engineering uh, let's not use the word system engineering if you're working in yeah. like mu- multiple uh, subdomains in robotics you get a very superficial understanding of them mm. i don't agree with that of course if if you're working in like multiple subdomains in a startup in robotic because that is your job it's not that you will have the same level of understanding as a like research engineer working for let's say mm. deep learning 
uh, for XYZ application. Although your application mm-hmm. might be the same, but you will not have his or her understanding. Mm-hmm. But you will have enough to build stuff. Like, come yeah. I mean, I agree. And I think that's where the flavors or the growth or maturity of a startup matter. Um, if you're joining a very early stage company, which barely has the resources to get their first prototype or POC out the door, then quite often than not, you'll be so hard pressed for time and resources right. and knowledge. Right. You might end up in that bracket or that bucket of people with superficial knowledge because you would really need to just get the damn thing working or doing something. So that right. if it no, just does that's, something. That's, that's true. <laughs> and I've, I've experienced that at a place. Uh, and it's, it's just not the best situation to be in as well. So that basically uh, brings me to the topic of like challenges in robotics and especially mm-hmm. sp- startups for us. Mm-hmm. The thing with robotics is that it is money intensive. Mm-hmm. A lot more than pure software dev, right? Because you have mm-hmm. software, you have hardware and hardware is fucking expensive. If you have a lot of money and you don't think it through, it can just become a black hole where you're throwing money. And after mm-hmm. a long time, you realize that, oh, oh shit, like we, we just lost a lot of money. We did not think it through. But on the other side, as you said, uh, if there is a startup which doesn't have a lot of money, so they are, they are pressed for resources, mm-hmm. it might also mean that people will not even get enough resources to build something, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. where resource could be time resource could be like stuff you want to buy uh so Mm -hmm. that is the biggest challenge i think and uh a a good startup knows how to like balance it so that actually comes down to the people you're working with i actually think Mm -hmm. uh it's and it's a general thing of course uh the people you work with is one of the most important decisions in your life Uh, yeah of course right because the same settings if you get a different set of people your experience and your liking towards the domain will change. You might end up not definitely liking if people around you are not uh, high energy and enthusiastic about it. So one of the things I really look at and I, I am usually very happy about is uh, people around me should love the domain as much as me mm-hmm. or hopefully even more. And uh, they should be like high energy, would want to be mm-hmm. problem solvers, like not siloed in their domains and say, this was my job, because that is a very, yeah. that is not the best place to be, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, and one last challenge, I think with startups is that because you're always pressed for time, like wherever you mm-hmm. are in a startup, uh, sometimes you might end up compromising your like, production quality or like the, your development cycle mm-hmm. in a way that your quality of work reduces. And that can... Mm-hmm come back to you in a very bad way in the future. Mm -hmm. I also think that the right startup knows the difference between instant gratification where you just do patchwork versus Mm -hmm. long-term thinking where you delay your like development by a little bit Mm -hmm. to do it well. There is of course a balance Mm -hmm. because a startup is pressed for time and uh, other resources. So for for instance, uh, stuff like test test infrastructure, I always... Mm -hmm push that it is super important. It might not look like it's super important in the moment, Mm -hmm. but if you can afford it, uh, Mm -hmm. spend a little more time on that because it is, it'll change your product later on. Uh, Mm -hmm. And you might end up with a very scalable system because I have also seen that if you do not develop your product well, and it goes into production, Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. will be stuck in the cycle of production where development takes a backseat and then people will be like, okay, this production gives us money. We just care about production. So just do patchwork and patchwork and patchwork. Forget Mm -hmm. about capability and scalability. So that is another big challenge I think is there in robotics and not like startups. Yeah, but I think that journey is also a lot of fun. Like I personally joined a startup or a product-based startup uh, working on cutting edge tech, but maybe not such bleeding edge tech, which might go into production only say 10 years or five years down the line. And the reason for that was I wanted to build something which gets produced in at least a moderate volume. Like um, my code went into maybe 3000 or 5000 units of a camera we made. And I actually wrote the functional test infrastructure that ran on the assembly line that I trained workers with, went to the assembly lines and kind of told people how to do the functional testing for our hardware and peripherals for that. 
and that aspect was what i always thought was a missing piece of the puzzle in my head with respect to learning stuff of the internet and working on hobby projects or the kind of stuff i was doing out of college so i mean beyond technical depth in just the aspect of the complexity of problems we were solving or the features in the product that we had and kind of a very diverse feature set attacking all these different subdomains i felt just the unique problems that come with making 10 of something versus 50 versus 500 versus 5000 versus 50000 that in itself when you are forced to learn what goes into assuring that level of quality which satisfies all the criteria for all those subdomains not just because because when you're writing functional tests or when you're testing your robotic software it's not just the fact that um you know you wrote an algorithm which works perfectly in simulation and then you run it and uh, if there's correctness it's sufficient no it needs to be running at the frame rate which makes it even usable for the rest of the algorithms downstream right it needs to be running in a way that the motors not running hot and blowing up in the clients in the field and you kind of have those physical aspects covered as well it needs to be running so that the power consumption budget doesn't overshoot and your system actually boots up in the first place so <laughs> sequencing your boot times there, there are so many aspects which come into productionizing a product as well which i i think makes it very appealing to be in a startup as long as you get to work on those sort of challenges like you build the best software stack and then you get stuck on something like okay but the damn thing takes a minute to boot <laughs> and nobody's going to use it if that happens so just the ux aspect of it or you know the uh satisfying all these other requirements which usually wouldn't even occur to you on working in simulation or a system which is already booted up and you're just kind of doing stuff with it i think that that's also an interesting aspect that um you end up looking into as far as the capital intensive comment you made yes definitely it is a lot so and yes the people matter and you rightly so leverage the experience that others have before you in terms of what they bring to the table what they might have learned in bigger companies or in previous startups of their own or others um so that you at the very least come up with new ways of messing things up right i mean that's what i try to do no, like course. things will obviously go wrong there's no way in hell that you build a product whether in a big or a small company and everything works perfectly on track within timelines within budget while keeping middle and upper management happy that right. never, yeah, happens. never happens that, that, that's a pipe dream so the only thing you can strive for is to kind of not be superficial like you mentioned have the time and resource at least to go deeper to root cause something and then avoid at least that problem from resurfacing if you can do that in addition to what you mentioned by being test driven and focusing on the testing aspect of your development processes and things of that sort i think that ups the level of quality of your engineering even on constrained resources when you can't buy the most fancy tools which automate things for you or allow you to do development processes which are there in much bigger companies uh, because you can't afford the licenses of the tools that you need to do it that certain mm-hmm. way mm-hmm. so as long as you know the approach you know what goes in you can make it that conscious decision like i said of shipping something right now cutting back on a feature focusing it on it later while having the know how and the chops to pull it off when it comes to that later part because you'll always have those cycles between just shipping the best version of that product and now starting work on the next one either the next product or the next version and kind of knowing what aspects to focus on instead of just cramming it with more features maybe focusing on reliability and testing and iteration because you can't put the cart before the horse as well right a lot of the right. things that you said in terms of test dev- development if you don't have the same thing that you're building again and again uh, mm-hmm. which is which would be too boring for us and we wouldn't be at such a company uh, which is just building a um, you need to build some level of a for it to be in some level of a finished stage before you can start with that journey of maybe taking it from a proof of concept to a proper solid prototype right to a product so right. i feel that gap or or that journey brings in those aspects on its own and you just need to be around smart people who know when to shift gears into those yeah. different yeah yeah so that's that's super important like working with people who are like who who also think this way 
and yeah. there might be i mean there usually are instances where other people are thinking something you aren't and that is also that's yes. the best place to be in right because you want to combine yeah, yeah. different people you don't want a uh, redundancy there all the time so some but, friction is always good because sparks fly and then that's also a lot yeah, of fun yeah, i mean yeah. i feel like being opinionated is underrated in tech like you, if you have the chops or the argument to rationally kind of support your particular architecture decision uh, w- with the underlying basis that everybody in the room is not married to their solution or ego testicle about their approach purely because it's their approach but more so because it's the best way to solve that technical problem if everybody is serving the product it's like playing in a band right if you are there to show off your drum chops or your guitar solos it will probably not be the most pleasing audience experience even though it might be a very egotistical and satisfying experience for yourself yeah. that you practice this one fill or that one solo or yeah, that one but the things won't come together it will more it's so just likely it, that it's going to sound bad when it comes yeah, to that but but if you come up with interesting stuff which does serve the music as well as right. long as whatever you're doing and fighting about at the end of the day that discussion if it leads to something which ups the game of the entire song the entire band and serves the music or the genre you're playing in i think that's what actually pushes you to do better and come up with genuinely novel and fun and interesting stuff yeah like i don't like uh, cold plays guitarist at all <laughs> but uh, i mean like like when he's playing with the band like it it it, it just comes together that's fine like as a guitarist yeah. i'm like no 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 <laughs> yeah um, i know but as a drummer you always get flack for like trying to override everybody else and just <laughs> increase the volume and like be the annoying guy playing stuff while everybody is tuning yeah mm-hmm. but okay yeah fair yeah enough. as long as whatever you're doing serves the music i feel even in the kind of products that you're building uh you, you should kind of do that and i also feel in today's maybe uh times disruption and very fast rapid iteration is becoming so overrated that we are losing sight of quality engineering yeah i think people are in such a rush to slap together components to build something and for for no fault of theirs i think a lot of conventional software engineering or say saas applications or web based applications have reached that level of maturity that probably robotics or uh, hardware based product frameworks haven't that mm-hmm. people get accustomed to the notion that as long as you can slap together the pre-made building blocks and work on your secret sauce on top of it it's fine to do it in a day or a hackathon right but true engineering takes time okay. it takes a lot of brainstorming a lot of discussion understanding requirements and all these classical boring non sexy um aspects which make it quality engineering and i i feel like um it's a given for people from an older generation or uh people who have more experience and have burnt their fingers way too many times but maybe that's one thing that a lot of young people don't get exposure to of how much to value all these boring aspects of building the damn thing because yeah. it doesn't have to work just once it has to work yeah exactly day. exactly because so the thing is you don't want a system to work for the next two months you want it to like mm. work work for the longer duration right so yeah. it's it's just super important to be patient about it of course there there is a balance because as you also said there are resource constraints you need to deliver yeah. but you don't want to build a castle with like no base at all and it'll just all come yeah. down uh, if you don't pay attention yeah. so that brings me to my final question what do you think should be the steps to learn robotics when you're starting out and then mm-hmm. gradually throughout the journey itself mm. so a sort of reverse engineering approach that i slowly started recommending to a lot of juniors and peers is to first maybe understand what companies need when they say, say they want a robotics engineer because at the end of the day if you're going to be working somewhere in that domain and you imagine yourself as a robotics engineer go out there and look at job descriptions <laughs> look at the skills that they're asking for it's a very pragmatic way of approaching things i feel because any other way ends up being um probably more self serving and journeyish than practical and things which would kind of land you because a lot of the stuff will be things that do, that you learn on the job right right so you first need to land that job 
So you either approach it from a domain that you've already experienced in, of course, you need to start with some sort of engineering, I would imagine. Um, you, one could argue that you could go from the entire uh, liberal arts background and service the trolley po problem for self-driving cars and look into the ethics of AI and all of that, if that's your speed. But if you're talking about, say, systems engineering, covering aspects of mechanical, electrical, electronics, embedded firmware, and computer vision, deep learning software, the kind of engineering we are talking about right now, you need to be relatively strong in one aspect, maybe enter into the workforce with that aspect, get exposed to the rest, and then sort of build up and find your way around what aspect of it is that you like and you enjoy or you want to do next. Because it's totally fine to kind of do what you and I did, which is enter with certain assumptions, get our world frames shattered and then take a hard right. Because I feel that's what makes us unique and not boring. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I feel like um, understanding which are the solved problems or which are the um, not so in demand skill sets for a particular role ends up being very grounding as well. Like for example, I remember um, almost being taken aback at the fact that uh, I saw so many roles for robotics engineering and I'd go and I'd know literally nothing on the requirements for that job because they would be totally focused on computer vision or deep learning or say navigation aspects. Mm -hmm. And it's only in better companies I found that the job role itself does not end up being that ambiguous. They would specify that they're looking for somebody for navigation, somebody for controls, somebody for firmware, somebody for all the different parts. So I think an overarching advice would be don't think you can be all of those at once. Try to at least go to the depth as much as possible through your own personal projects or whatever to have decent skills in one aspect of it enter with that, gain experience in that, and in parallel, start exploring the others. Right. And, so, yeah, uh, sorry. So and for, 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 ex for exploration, I feel like uh, while we dissed a bit on the online coursework and the MOOCs that we mentioned, but they serve as a very interesting or a very educative uh, tasting platter, if nothing else. Like you at least get a feel for the domain to understand if this is what you want. Is This is the problem that you want to be breaking your head on for say a week or a month. Like I, I feel it gives you that sense that do I want to be the person who would rather be focusing on how do I get this board to pass EMI EMC compliance for the next one month? Or do I want to be the person who focuses only on the path planning algorithm or the control theory or just the firmware part to get the latest and greatest embedded board working with the peripherals that I need? So you kind of pick a domain and then you branch out and navigate around. I guess. Right. So what I usually think about learning in robotics is that more than anything else, uh, you have to start working on projects. They can be simple projects. They can be whatever you want. But working on projects brings a lot of clarity and a lot of things you have not even thought about. Um, mm -hmm. So I think working on projects and the best case scenario would be you working on projects with people who are working in this domain. For example, mm -hmm. if you're a student, uh, more than doing university courses, of course, do your courses, do whatever you want there. Mm -hmm. uh, working with a professor who works in this mm -hmm. domain is yeah. a brilliant thing to do. You see a lot of things, you get access to a lot of resources. So that works well in your favor. And that usually is a game changer. You mm. get exposed to all of this and then you learn things on the fly because starting out, you don't know a lot of things. Well, robotics is a domain where at least I always think that there, there is still a world to learn, right? Yeah. Like you just, you, you always are at 1% of the, like the, mm. the, the entire thing. But uh, working with people changes everything. It, of course, applies to other domains as well. But because robotics is a multidisciplinary yeah. domain, it just helps because otherwise, uh, I, so I don't diss on online courses per se. I kind of diss a little on the university degrees, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, not on online courses because uh, even I, I took a similar path as you where uh, when I wanted to move to robotics properly, properly, I... Uh, mm -hmm looked at job descriptions and I saw things I had no clue about and I, I still applied for them. Okay. And one of the uh, companies gave me an interview. Uh, it was the HR round. And then uh, the first thing that guy says is, uh, yeah, we have a lot to talk about. And his next question was, have you worked with Ross? I said, mm -hmm. 
so so he immediately uh, went blank and then he said uh, okay uh, what have you worked on so i had worked on like hardware engineering for robotics and stuff mm-hmm. but uh, it was still very different from what a robotics engineering profile would want and mm-hmm. then he was like um it's just not going to work out and i said thank you so much now i know what i want to learn and then i went back yeah. i did online courses on that so so i learned ross uh, from uh, uh udacity no no uh, udacity and that also like led me to mm-hmm. the to the uh, uh youtube construct from the yeah. youtube channel but, but from yeah. udacity and then so gradually things build up based on reverse engineering like you did so i mm-hmm. i did a similar thing uh but in the end if you're working with people you just get exposed to all of this and i know like learning in robotics is is tricky i mean at least i i found mm-hmm. it back then it took me a long time to figure out a way and that was basically working with people for mm-hmm. free as well uh that i was able to like find my way to this uh, people honestly don't like the idea of working for free at all i i'm just a, it's 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 just a weird thing to me i mm-hmm. understand that like you should not work for free but the thing mm-hmm. is if you want to learn something and you have almost no skills there why would someone pay you if you're not bringing anything to the table yeah, like of if, course. If, if they do it's great right that's the best place to yeah. be but having that high sense of ego when you have no skills to show is, yeah i don't think the best way to go about it of course as long as you can afford it and as long as you're privileged if you're not yeah. so there are some issues there of course i mean you cannot do it but that's that yeah but, but but then if you go into like a bigger company you most probably would have better work life balance and you'll have more spare time to divert your efforts into learning what the domains that you're interested in as well yeah. right uh, b- because i think the mm-hmm. other aspect of what you're saying is that things have gotten so much better they're only getting more and more better in terms of being able to run simulations on the cloud Uh, run an a totally online platform like the construct sim or like a couple of others wherein you need not even spend nights setting up things on your own machine in terms of the tool chains to actually learn about this stuff right. wherein there's enough resources to learn the basics of python or c++ or c in that case and even with something as simple as python go into the depth of the algorithms and the concepts that become relevant for say navigation path planning computer vision um uh, state estimation and localization and things of that sort so i feel curation becomes a problem quite often because there's so many resources out there and uh, i see your videos on youtube and i think your intent is also to kind of start curation in this domain where there is a scarcity of it which i think is great but yeah in general i i think um there's a lot that you can do with internet access on a moderately decent machine than you could maybe even 5 years ago or 10 years ago and i think it's a good time to be alive and to okay. divert resources and energy and if you're patient with yourself and also very um ballsy i think you can be rewarded in very interesting ways um An, an example i love is this guy we have for who's working with us as a mechanical engineering intern and now a full time person was literally walking on the street saw my company's board got interested walked inside said i want an internship here and it, i don't know what big companies but startups really value that level of initiative so work and is something i say right like that's this is an yeah. example of that that changed his trajectory yeah. right yeah exactly so and i mean I think the best open secret in the world of startups and job hunting is that most people will either not have the job descriptions online <laughs> or have accurate job descriptions online because of various reasons and it's never a bad idea to just ask and try to have a very simple conversation and just reach out on LinkedIn say you like this work this is what you've done and is there an opening because you never know when that timing might click right and exactly. you also have to understand how it's never not so often about being good enough in the domain as it is about being a good fit 
because okay. I, I, I'm in a position where I end up having to interview even people who are veterans in the industry who have 15 years, 20 years of experience, 10 years of experience for senior firmware roles. And um, what I end up learning is that just because they have 10, 12 years of experience doesn't mean they're necessarily suited for the kind of work we do where it ends up being so diverse in terms of the frameworks we work with, the technologies we work with, and the kind of environment or mindset you need to be in to always constantly be a learner. Exactly. Like that learner mindset does not come naturally to people. And one might even argue that it gets worse the more deeper you go into just one domain, mm-hmm. right? So you, uh, there are of course exceptions. There are of course a lot of people who, uh, constantly are on the lookout for learning new technologies and their history ends up being that diverse. But um, I'm just saying there's multiple ways of getting there. And um, as a fresher, as somebody who is new new to the domain, other than the learning aspect of the skills required or the jobs required to execute the job, a lot of these tiny aspects are also things which come over time, over rejections. You send 400 emails, you get 10 responses. Mm-hmm. One of those ends up being a job offer, if at all, and things yeah. of that sort. Yeah, that's true. But I think the both of us agree that based on our experiences, a good strategy is to leverage whatever online resources you have, mm-hmm. online resources plus university resources you have to understand mm-hmm. these different pieces of the puzzle. And in parallel or just after that, uh, usually in parallel, uh, find an opportunity to work with people it could be mm-hmm. any yeah, any of sort of opportunity and that is yeah. when you see these things coming together and you understanding what part you like more or like what parts you like more and mm-hmm. then you are exposed to different frameworks different technologies there state of the art things uh things you should not do as an engineer so a lot of learning comes from real life experiences mm-hmm. and that is built on top yeah. of you on your own trying to get these pieces of this big puzzle and of course i don't think robotics is a domain where you can ever say that hey i think i'm i'm good like i've, I've learned enough it's just that yeah you're always, the, the insecurity yeah. never goes away yeah i mean you're always learning and you're always like hey there is so much stuff to understand like i've just touched the domain superficially for people who find this idea exciting it is a beautiful domain like you're, you're gonna learn for a long, long, long time and hopefully for a lifetime. Uh, for some people like who are not interested in like looking at these subdomains, understanding how they come together and continuously learn, uh, then maybe this domain is not like super suited for you, but like people with a zeal for learning uh, and like my, learning about multiple subdomains, it is it is a great time to be alive in this domain. Yeah, yeah. I think the non-linear path that you take is also something which we should normalize more through conversations because it's totally normal to feel like hey this is the coolest thing ever and i get to build such cool stuff and the next day be bogged down with why do i do this at all (laughs) am i even a robotics engineer yeah that seesaw is normal and that happens yeah this happens this happens all the time from an engineering or a quality standpoint, I feel like one thing which I wish people had told me was try to pursue projects which take time and last very long. What mm-hmm. I mean by that is uh, beyond the point, personal projects get you only so far. Yeah. If you can try to get on board like an open source project with a lot of people smarter than you sometimes uh, working on that with you because When you go to a company or you work on anything worth doing, quite often it's not a rockstar coder who gets it done, it's a rockstar team who gets it done. And you will never have all the skill sets. You need to be conversant in enough domains to understand the challenges, root cause something, maybe look at a problem from different angles, but you will always have to work in a team which brings together expertise from different domains and different years of experience to actually get the job done because that's how that's the nature of development in the real world for any complex problem and and i feel like that's something that we're not taught or that's not highlighted enough that the amount that you learn from actually sticking to a product a project for six months 
is a lot more than doing six projects which are one month each De- definitely and in fact in robotics i think when you're working on a product six months is also like too short a duration to yeah, yeah, have a deeper understanding of anything yeah right so yeah i mean that is one of the most important things in robotics but yeah i mean thank you so much man this was a really nice conversation and also it was nice to catch up with you after yeah, yeah. months same here same here yeah, yeah this was, i think we've been planning this for a while this was a lot of fun yeah exactly i mean i hope this like someone out there <laughs> finds this interesting <laughs> this was just an interesting <laughs> conversation for us if if yeah. someone is watching this video and finds this interesting it will be like worth it yeah e- even other i hope just... nobody's watching it right now because that would be a zoom security flaw but yeah <laughs> <laughs> i hope but yeah uh, thank you so much for being here man like this was a yeah. great conversation my pleasure a lot of fun Take care, man. Okay, yeah, take care. Bye-bye.